Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Bird Watching 101, How to Get Started. And it will be presented by our fabulous NetHab expedition leader, Arpita Dutta. Arpita, thank you so much for being here today. Let's just dive right in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, and uh, yeah, this is Arpita. And I thought that why, I mean, when we are so much, you know, enthusiastic about wildlife, about environment, nature, and um, to visit different places to explore that land, why not start with the basic thing? where rather we most of us have started with and i think this is one uh, significant part in exploring wildlife is uh, birding because that teaches us a lot of things and while we start birding we understand another few i mean a vast area of nature which help us to understand the animal. So it's for that. Um, all, all, all are uh, like, uh, I think you can welcome this birding into your life if you, still not if you're not doing it. And I'll just carry on that why and how it should, uh, we should do this. So yeah, uh, without uh, taking more time. Um, so, I think uh, birds are uh, the creature we all look up to, you know, when we are young or we are old, I mean, becoming old, I think they are everywhere. And the best part is we always see them flying, like the land animals, we observe, we see their behavior, and it's pretty fascinating. But when we see that, Oh gosh, it is flying high. I mean, you know, being a child, I think most of us would say, wish we could like fly like birds. Or if we have to reach somewhere, we say that, oh, wish I got to, I got the wings. So these are the thing, I think it makes the birds more fascinating uh, in our life. And no matter how, how the bird is, best, the thing is they can fly. And yes, <clears throat> with that, uh, will this our flying uh, uh, friends? I mean, there are near about eighteen thousand taxa. Means with all the subspecies and everything which are there in the world, that's a huge number, right? And uh, not only that, and birds are like everywhere. I mean, starting from the tundra to the Arctic. You see all the tropical, the subtropical forest has so many species of birds. And wherever we go, how we see the plants, it's more often that we come across some of the birds out there. And yeah, so that makes it more easy for us, more entertaining for us, rather I would say. And to keep up the momentum, especially well, in the national park, especially in India, or wherever you go, it's more like we focus on the animals that which are there. But you know, always we don't come across an animal. Suppose, for example, the tiger. When you are coming here, everywhere, every uh, track, you don't get to see the, see the big cat. But you know, in between time, we see so many birds, we get to hear so many birds that we get engaged. It's, a, it's an amazing engagement because they are always on move. Either they are even perched somewhere, at least we can see it. And if we don't, their twittering or chattering will reach to our ear. We can hear them and we know that the presence is there. They have been communicating. They are doing something. So yeah, that's that's the best presence of, uh, I think, looking at bird or the thought of doing birdie. <clears throat> so with that, with that factor, 
that they actually fill up the gaps. Uh, another factor is they are colorful, they are vocal, and they're intelligent. Because how we have seen the birds have evolved and how they actually adapt to the environment, to their own environment, is incredibly uh, a sign of intelligent. And of course, when we talk about colors, we see so many beautiful birds. I mean, if you have ever been to Costa Rica or have been thinking of uh, or have already been to Papua New Guinea or in the in the tropical uh, region or in the rainforest, you see all the birds are, my God, they are amazingly colorful. And you know, all those shiny, especially with sunbirds, um, your hummingbirds, you see all this quadzel. I mean, there are so many birds with so shiny metallic finish they have in their feather and in the sunlight. Oh my God, they look stunning. I mean, it's it's amazing to see them, you know, even if you don't want to know about them, but it's so blissful and, and uh, feels, uh, I mean, it's a treat to your eyes to see them. And they're vocal. Um, they're vocalization whether it's a call or a song which i'll come later <clears throat> their calling is something you know no matter what is a tweety or or a jay or you or a sparrow you actually make out a lot of difference or an owl so it, their voice and their call actually makes you feel that okay something is around i mean nature is alive you know that that thing is definitely there yeah and their vocalization has so much to do with communication and once you understand it it's become so easy and um to relate yourself with nature to connect with yourself i mean to connect with nature so yeah with that <clears throat> so we have the different geographical landforms uh we have these lakes rivers plateaus mountain forest uh some uh you know ice uh, icy terrain and stuff so every land formation has a place for the birds because because of their number because of the huge in number they can actually move and another thing is because they can fly they of course change their habitat depending on their food availability and of course uh it's a it's a way of you know dispersing from one place to another but yeah specific species of birds choose to stay in specific type of um landforms or environment so yeah we can see i mean when we talk about antarctic imagine how the, it's it's all white it's all snow the icebergs and and the snow flats out there we see the birds, though they are flightless, but we see the birds out there. And uh, then we come to the tropical forest uh, in the in the dry deciduous or moist deciduous forest. We see another bunch of birds. All the mostly we have the passerine uh, birds who can sing and who can perch. And then we have this all deep, you know, broad leaf rainforest areas we have birds in savannas we have birds in i mean below the tundra uh, region or we have birds in the wetland or the pelagic birds which are close to the ocean so yeah ocean and seas <clears throat> so imagine it's you are never bored the first thing i would say but you are never bored that okay we are walking and it's a long stretch if we start looking if we start listening to these birds i think it's a, it's always an entertaining and engaging uh for for a human for for people like us and with that <clears throat> not only uh seeing them or getting to know them but i think birding is has an amazing advantages I mean, you know, connection with nature, it connects, birding connects you with nature because when we look around, we see not only the birds, but the entire environment over there. So with that environment, you actually know 
uh, I mean, it's a it's a kind of an awareness you get from the environment when you connect with that. And when you connect with nature, we all know that we stay happy. And that's the reason why we all gather together to listen to webinars or to explore different areas, to go into different countries to see other animals rather than our own countries. So yeah, all these things are there. And in, it has an amazing, it is scientifically proved that it has an amazing uh, your uh, mental uh, i mean it effect on your mental health because if you do birding uh, it's a stress reliever you hardly get into depression and of course because you see things so differently and you focus on such nice things uh, so I, that that makes you that makes you pretty uh, you know engaging for that and then physical activity so you cannot do birding only at from one place every day so you have to keep moving walking sometimes you have to climb a hill to reach that uh, reach that spot where that bird is so yeah it, it needs a lot of physical activity whether you are doing cycling while doing cycling you can watch birds uh, while walking, you can do that. While running, you can do that. So, and ev imagine even while birding, taking up the binocular and putting down, taking out your notebooks. And I think it's a, it's a lot of lot of activity is related to it. So, of course, it's uh, it's good for your physical activity. Then it's a lifelong learning. I and like even if you are learning about one species it's always amazing to see the different individual doing uh, be, uh, showing different behavior so your observation you're keeping observation on the same part you know changes uh and you get to know more about it and you get to and if you are observing one species in the same area and they are in a flock maybe after 10 years you actually can say that what are the environmental changes has happened maybe the number might get uh you know decrease or the number of that flock may increase so all these different changes actually uh you know make you learn a lot about that area and the bird and social opportunities of course uh nowadays we are so busy uh that hardly we get in uh you know get like getting get together and stuff though in india uh we kind of no don't believe in personal space so <laughs> but here here we that we hardly get time to do that but you know we have some birding groups so either on saturday or sunday or at least once in a month we all go out to look for some birds to see to take notes uh field notes about their behavior or what exactly uh where the birds uh, are there, which are the birds has arrived in that area. So all this, so this is a very good social opportunity, you know, to connect with the fellow birders. And of course, then travel uh, and explore uh, new areas uh, with those uh, with those birds, of course. Here we, I, I still remember, here uh, in, uh, in Bhutan, uh, we suddenly saw uh, one ibis bill, which is very rare. And I saw it and I, uh, I mean, we all got down from our van and we started looking at that bird uh, like uh, over there for, I think we were there for 15 minutes looking exactly how it was uh, picking, uh, you know, trying to pick uh, in between the stones and trying to get the food. So yeah, it was an amazing engagement for a uh, good 15 uh, minutes and the bird has completely uh, kept us entertaining while doing all those uh, while uh, displaying its behavior and uh, photography and art of course people who are photographers they they have a different area imagine for uh, Tim Lehman who is a wildlife uh, photographer so he when he when he was uh, clicking all those uh, capturing all those birds of paradise moment. Imagine <clears throat> how he has uh, done it. I mean, while climbing it into the top of the trees to get the birds or making a hide. So I think there are a lot of dramas, you know, a lot of character 
actually gives when you do when you engage yourself into birding and of course art is there you when we draw we do some pens of course in indian paintings and stuff we have a lot of stories of birds and even i think from our um a different civilization different era of civilization birds been a very prominent character in all the wall paintings uh, all the calves all this i mean any any anything uh, over there i think birds is a very very uh, like top uh, among the top uh, i mean among all the animal it is one of the top which we have come across in most of the older civilization um, uh, creations so yeah and uh, of course then there is the contribution of science that i'll i'll talk later but where, why i am here today is uh, just to give you a, a little hints of your to start body and that is also before you get social uh, i mean a social connection before you build uh, i mean build a lifelong you know um, learning or the physical activity i think um, what you can start with it's uh, the backyard birding even if it's a it's a raven and uh, or a robin and you if you if you can you know develop that there are so many benefits and it's it's like entertainment stress release um insect control and alternative to pets because pets you have to keep inside and of course we have a lot of responsibility when we adopt some babies um i mean fur baby um or a feather uh, pet in our house but imagine when you connect with the birds around your backyard they become like your pet like every day you see them uh, what they are doing and when they get used to with your presence sometimes they really come close because when they don't feel threatened uh, it takes time but when they don't feel threatened they actually come close to you i mean if you have bird feeders in your house you know that how close they can come and uh, sometimes they even if i know that from my uh, it's an everyday thing my moms uh, give food for the birds and uh, by around 1:30 during lunch time around 1 1:30 in the afternoon so if it is if it has crossed one they start calling even few of them come inside our dining room sit on the table and keep calling that okay this is the time where are you guys i mean where is our food so and they are they are like wild they are they are not been trained or anything so i think that you know mutual respect that relationship definitely builds and that's that's a big benefit for uh, your backyard uh, birding that you always have uh this feathered friends around so for start your backyard uh birding i think if you are uh interested if you get well, how you can start is a uh, like one binocular one guidebook so that you can see that which bird you are observing and of course those thing if you if you can manage if you are living in a very vast area a big wetland a scope is very good because you see really far and nice and you can even take pictures with that so yes these these are the only thing and a notebook though we are very used to with the phone nowadays but still i prefer to write everything in a notebook because you can do the sketch and stuff that exactly like in this branch it was doing like this this was the shrub so yeah we gave, we actually in the field notebook we can give a visual and then we can write that exactly how the birds uh, were behaving what they were doing so yeah these are the only four things i mean three things rather you need a guidebook a binocular and a notebook and <clears throat> the first thing what you can observe in your backyard first see look for the movement of bird when you see the bird see their features the main features just to see that which uh like which family this bird falls in because you have the guidebook now and because first we see their like the size of the birds i'll come to that but the feature 
when we talk about the main features, suppose the beak. So depending on their feeding habit, they have different types of beak. So for imagine for a crow or a raven, you, if you see this beak or an insect catching bird, which have a small conical beak, and then you have finch, like mostly in the bird feeders and all, these finches and everything come. And for the nectar feeder has this carved, very uh, like needle like uh, uh, tongue they would have, but they will have this sickle or curved uh, beak, pointed beak, uh, the nectar feeder. And the fruit eating birds, of course, they have, they have to crush a lot of fruit or seeds, they have that. And see the fishing birds, they have a big, uh, you know, uh, the lower uh, the lower beak has a skin attached to it to get the feed out there. So yeah, like this, and uh, <clears throat> this one in the abacid also they have, they actually scan or they actually take uh, small uh, crustaceans and stuff from the mud. So they it is more like a, a stainer kind of a beak. So yeah. If you look at these beaks, you know that you are looking at a different bird. So those, those things are there, no matter even if the sizes are same. And then, of course, the claw is there or the talons are there or the feet. So different feet are adapted to different for different habitat. Suppose if I say this Japan as the water birds, which are there, uh, so they have they have very long uh, slender claw and because they have to walk on the foliage or walk on the floating uh, uh, like vegetations so they their body weight has to be you know uh, sp uh, spread out so that's the reason why they have to have that long feet and then the woodpecker like the claw they would they need to climb and uh, ostrich and all, they mostly walk on the land. So they have to have a very strong foot. Uh, imagine the elephant, they, of course, uh, they are like that. The sparrow, it's to for the perch or to clean. So they have this thin, tiny uh, holding uh, thing, the talons, all the raptors, which we have, they need a strong talons. So look, at the, look at the nails out here. I mean, the claws rather, <laughs> the claws out here, they're sharp, they're carved and their talons are very strong. So yeah, this is how you can see the feature that this is the beak, this is the feet. And then if anyhow you see the eggs, so every species of birds had different types and shapes and size of uh, eggs they have. And then you, what you need to develop is the spotting scale. Initially, with the binocular, it becomes little challenging because you see the bird with your bare eye, but with the binocular, it is difficult to focus. So you have to develop that skill that when you see, you see, suppose a bird is hopping in one area, they are restless hardly we see some good i mean big raptors and all where they have this patience to be at one perch and look out for the prey but for smaller birds for passerine birds they are keep on moving right it's difficult to focus so what you can do is you see an area where the bird where the bird is hopping and with the binocular you focus in that area so once your uh, focus is there, then you start moving the binocular without, you know, without moving your hand, uh, hand from it. Like the binocular should be fixed then once you focus in that area. Then you look through that where exactly the bird could be. I'm sure you will get to see some movement of the leaves or some branches or you see this little one is hopping from one branch to another, it becomes easier to focus uh, on the birds, I mean, on the move, uh, movement of the birds. And then I would say uh, for the calls, I mean, this is how you can spot. And now if you cannot see it, but you can hear it, how would you know that? I mean, the bird calls, of course I know, but I would just, to mention, to bring a little interest, is uh, most of the time when we are talking to each other, imagine at home, we talk, right? But 
suddenly we find very romantic or suddenly our mood like becomes really good and we sing but just think when we talk the effort we give but when we sing we have to give little more effort right but we can give that we can do that but for birds they do their call it's a regular thing okay and the song especially done by the male to impress the female and also to claim their territory during the breeding season so mostly the singing bird sing during the breeding time and rest of the time mostly they call few birds call is even uh, like uh, it seems like they are singing like this a uh, blue whistling thrush and all the whistling thrush their their voice is uh, fabulous i mean you go inside the deep into the forest and you get to hear this thrush uh, calling or singing it, it's it's a very soothing uh, feeling to your ears yeah so this is how then you focus that what i do sometimes is i close my eyes and i feel that okay which are all the like noise or which are all the calls i can hear and if you live in a forested area or if you go out in birding where there are good movement of birds you will see you will get to hear a lot of different calls and so you you start noticing that okay today this five calls were new new to you right these are the one you can record uh, those calls so that you can check later that which bird call it could be so this is how you get involved into birding and imagine while listening to the birds uh, you actually connect more closely to nature because your concentration and that's kind of a meditation because you know meditation the first thing is i feel that you know you have to shut down a lot of things but imagine when we are trying to focus at which are all the uh, sound we are hearing so your focus is to get those sounds so i think already our rest of the uh, you know mind boggling things uh, are already like shut down at that point of time and then after the calls <clears throat> just try to uh, get to know more about uh, a little more about the birds because when you are starting or you were looking at it you just just simple things just like this one the highest flying bird this bar headed goose can fly over mount everest or the deepest uh, diving bird though it's a flightless bird but deepest diving bird is the penguin and our the fastest uh, uh, like diver in the air is our peregrine falcon so yeah knowing about this how this happened how the mechanism uh, go out how uh, without acclimatization this bar headed geese can actually maintain their flight during the migration so i think all these questions gets you more close not to only know about the birds but also about the nature and the environment how evolution and nature has come together and did this magnificent you know way of uh, living how how they actually live so <clears throat> while you know that the features the main features and stuff so what to notice you know the first thing is the color how is the color where are the colors and the size the habitat and the behavior so once you know where the color is or how you describe a bird in your field guide there would be a bird with labeling all this like you even if you don't know all the birds at least know the few a very few prominent parts of their body like this crown the crown the supercilium the nape all this the lower the bill all all these are you know because the color changes here a lot of character actually takes there in the in the uh, i mean near this area and the wings you know there are patterns how how the colors 
so all these things are there. So I think over here, this area and this area is very important and then definitely the tail is there. So yeah, <clears throat> and the color of the feet or toe. So if you slowly, and then you get to know uh, everything, but slowly if you start with only only few of this labeling, I think you can actually make out the difference of the colors and, uh, and especially the birds. And then it comes to size. Suppose if you're asking someone or if you see that how you say that, okay, this was the bird, this is the color, but what, how is the bird? Like it's a sparrow size bird. So that you can, that you can actually visualize that, that you can observe that how big it is. Or if it is a big one, then you can see that it's a gull, uh, you know, size bird. Okay, or a hawk, it looks like a raptor. It's a hawk uh, uh, size bird. So yeah, those things are, those things matters a lot because whenever we are explaining the color, the size, these all matter and exactly in which habitat we have seen them. So when we say that in habitat, imagine the raptors where they have to prey on it. So they need to have, these are one uh, like, the uh, I mean black wing kite and the kestrel they were they are mostly the field open field area uh, bird because they feeds on all those rats or lizards like that so they would be they will be perched in one place and they would look around uh, to see that area so in open area we get to see this kind of birds a lot and then maybe near the lakes or beside the river we see this spoonbill is there, open bill stork, uh, all this, I mean, which are related, mostly related, their, their staple food is fish or water bugs and stuff, and they would be close to uh, the rivers. I mean, there are numerous, uh, like pretty good number of birds, but you have we have to understand which are in, from the field guide you will get, which are the birds which lives close to what area. So here, suppose the forest hides, or mostly the passerine birds, uh, the small, uh, like this, this is a tickles blue flycatcher. So these, all these things, we know that, okay, this bird is found in this area, this type of habitat. So then it becomes easy. So imagine now you have the color, you have the size, and you know the habitat of the bird. So whenever you end, then the distribution of the bird. Of course, these birds are from India. So when we, when I know this bird is particularly from the southern and the central part of India, when we know that, then if we see that a little bigger than a sparrow sized bird, and then with this color, then at least we can sort it. I mean, uh, from that huge number, we can actually make it smaller, you know, uh, to we can get into a, like a telescopic thing that we can make into a smaller group that, okay, this will be among these birds because there are a few similar birds uh, which looks like a tickles blue. And then in the broadleaf forest, we if we know that this is the bird, then it's movement. Even if you see a small bird, which you cannot make out quite easily, but with experience, you know that if the bird is moving like this, uh, the movement of the bird makes, uh, I mean, will tell you that which bird it is. So imagine a behavior says that this could be this species. And most of the time, of course, once you, uh, once you know that, okay, these are the thing, it becomes easier for you to know. And how incredible it is that you can actually say by the movement that, okay, this bird is a nuthatch. Uh, so those, those things, I think that's, that's an amazing happiness what you, what you get through uh, this birding. And yeah, so if you, if you have to look for, like in the old trees or the dead branches, uh, as as it says that uh, anything, I mean, nothing get wasted in nature. So of course, even a dead tree or a dead branch is useful to a lot of creatures. And of course, for the birds like woodpecker, burbot, all this, all these type of birds, they actually drill, they make their uh, nest, and also 
they go for uh, you know catching bugs uh, grabs or ants which are moving in that area so yeah with that then we dead branch we can relate with some birds which could be from these families and when we see the bird we know that okay again the size color and the habitat it helps us to reduce our uh, search and then near the near the uh, you know the estuary area near the river uh, side or near the ocean where the waves are coming we see these plovers uh, stained uh, all this all this type of birds and uh, yeah so we know that again with the size how does it how does it look like so if i have to explain suppose if i have to explain this bird then i would say this is a small bird uh like uh, a starling uh, a little smaller than a starling and it has a it was moving near the shore uh picking the small crabs and uh, picking from the sand and then we explain that it has a white uh, belly and the white chest from uh, from uh, from the neck to the tail underparts is white it has a black broad collar and then it has a yellow ring around the eye and then we know that how was it behaving how it was walking how it was speaking if we start explaining those things we we can reach to the identification that which bird it is or rather it will become more easier for you to find in your uh, guidebook as well so with this we know this is a gull imagine look at this, this is a brown headed gull and see this it has a beautiful white patch half patch and a red circle around the eye then a white patch out here so of course these are a very specific uh characteristic when we see the girl i mean when we see the bird see its feet is red okay and near the tail of the tip there is a white patch out here so these are the one we actually look into uh birding and here again i said that you see the beak see they are nectar feeder so this is a sunbird this is a fire-tailed sunbird and uh so here is the beak and we see the color you see the shimmers out here you see the more prominent is the red and it's a fiery uh you know yellow uh, chest it has and it has a long red tail sorry this is a mrs gold sunbird um yeah so these these are the these are the specific characteristic by which we can explain uh the birds and of course this is this is in the mountain region uh, during the snowfall this is so bright this is a monal um, himalayan monal and uh, this what when we see this is very prominent because it's so colorful and especially during the mating i mean during the breeding time uh, the monal dances to impress the female so yeah here we can explain this is more like a pheasant and this is its color and the location is here so monal we won't see in the desert area when we see okay this color and all and you we have been to near the tundra area we know okay which bird it is we are talking about you know so relating imagine with every bird we actually know the uh, the uh, environment there or the ecology over there the ecosystem rather and then we know the distribution the area where we have seen this bird and then we have that how the bird is looking and what is their behavior so all these are coming to give us a conclusion that exactly how uh, we see the nature how we with birds we actually get to know a lot of things from nature so what do we see along with birds so if you are not a very professional or a very like a passionate birder but you love to see them that is also good because you know with birds we see a lot of other animals as well because if they get disturbed they fly so if you see that few birds are like picking or they're having uh like foraging uh feeding 
or maybe they are, they are on perch. And suddenly you see that they all started, uh, you know, flying or maybe even a raptor is sitting, it just flew. So those, those, those times are like, uh, I would say those are the indication that there could be something, you know, that they, they, they just suddenly flee, uh, flew. Because, and by that, we definitely get to see not only the smaller ones, but some bigger animals. Of course, we have, you can see that it was almost covered in the grass, this rhino. And there were a few manas uh, over there, the common, the jungle manas were there. And uh, suddenly, when our vehicle was coming close, suddenly these manas, you know, took a flight and we could not even see the manas because it was more uh, below that uh, grass uh, level because they flew all together we uh, stopped the vehicle out there and actually i stood up and i saw the rhino was there so unless these birds would have moved it would have been difficult for me to find the rhino because of the tall grass same goes with uh, the big cat as well you know so with birds even birding actually lead us to different uh, animals as well so it's bird birding is a very healthy uh, hobby actually and of course with the temperature with birds with their movement uh, you see the different species and different point of the time of the year and you know the time is changing or the season is changing so during winter you see all the uh, i mean during summer maybe all the robins and all they would come, they would fly in one place uh, to wintering because you know somewhere it is much more cooler so yeah that's how it's a yearly thing if you notice that okay this is this is the one i have seen this uh, for example i have seen a wagtail and this white white wagtail come here every year during this time and you know actually they maintain that calendar maybe two three or four days it will be here and there but that particular bird would be there and if you observe it every year you know this is the same one uh because you by then you will know by its behavior that what exactly that bird is doing and you know this is the even without tagging and all you know that okay there are high chances that this is the same old bird i mean it's like the winter is here and you can actually say hello to uh, your friends uh, friend or your own uh, backyard pet who are there to come to meet you every every winter so yeah with that so winter during migration if you go out near the water bodies or near the forest patches you will find a lot of different species of birds which uh you know we, which we which migrate from different parts of the world and of course there when we talk about migration birds are crazy you know um uh, your uh, the bar tail god with it flew from alaska to australia which is 8435 miles non-stop imagine it's non-stop it didn't stop all the way from alaska to australia it flew it's it was like a guinness world record uh i mean distance of course we have arctic turns more than i mean near about fifty six thousand uh, miles it uh, it covers but it's like uh back and uh like it's take a total turn but non-stop flight from alaska to australia just imagine this is these th to looking at this or just thinking about it that a bird how it could like come like fly from fly that distance without even stopping in between so yeah they are crazy the more we know about them the more I think it's it's fun it's so much of fun watching uh, uh watching them and now not only watching them while we are learning or we are trying to id the bird uh we actually can 
uh, gave you know that citizens uh, we can contribute in citizen science. We have few websites. I mean, we have few apps <clears throat> and sites. Sorry, which are like eBirds, uh, Audubon Society, and Seek is also an eBird. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, I naturalist thing. Your coronal. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is the Merlin Bird uh, app, and then you have this bird, uh, bird, bird watching bliss. I naturally over here. You these are the apps where you can actually click a bird. You can put that picture, and you can ask for the ID that which bird it is, and also you get an information about the bird where it has been seen which are the area, I mean, the distribution, all these things you can uh, generate. Like you can put your, uh, you can give your input, even what the bird was doing, where was the bird, whether it was resting like on the branch or on the ground, what it was doing. So these all small informations you can put. So it actually make a huge database, you know, for any change and researchers and all who are who all are working, they can get different ideas because when it is spread out, it's easier to get those informations and it, it will help you to gain more knowledge and information about those particular birds you really want to know about. So yeah, these are these are the apps uh, which will really help you uh, for your uh, for your birding. Uh, even in initial initial time, and it will it will carry on, and you can actually come up with some new observations or new distribution. You know that is that you have never seen that bird before uh, over there in that area. So if you come across that bird, so this is definitely uh, uh, it will be a it will be a great uh, thing to you know acknowledge. So yeah. You can you can help yourself and you can just enjoy your birding in that way and so do i and i think yeah most of more of most of us uh, we uh, we started with birding and we have reached out to, for me i have diverted to reptiles and uh, smaller mammals uh, so yeah but still bird makes me uh, you know that uh, I think more excited and especially when we are waiting for uh, the tiger or the elephant or the rhino I think they are the wonderful uh, animals are they're the wonderful uh, creatures to you know look uh, look around and uh, and it's very specific that if you start doing backyard birding um one day i mean if you if you have if you have never done it and if you start it and i'm sure then once you get that thing it is an addiction you then you would start roaming around you would feel like okay let me take my bicycle and just uh, take around just see which are the birds we have over here so of course stay fit keep birding and keep your mental health as blissful and as happy as possible Thank you so much. Uh, Sunny, I'm ready to take your questions. Arpita, thank you so much. That was so informative. I always learn so many interesting things from you. And I, I think you you are converting me to a birder. <laughs> I, I never paid birds that much attention before. And I, I will definitely be noticing things I didn't notice before. So thank you. Um, we do have some questions, and I want to remind everybody that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so the first question I have for you is, since all birds have a syrinx, I'm not going to say that right, syrinx, do they all have a song for mating or just singing? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't actually get the first word. But if it is related to song or singing, it's mostly this sing. I mean, not all birds, mostly the passerine birds. Uh, we say that the passerine bi birds are actually the singers. Uh, so they have the song during their breeding and uh, they use it. I mean, they sing during their breeding time and also for the territorial display or during the to mark the territory. So that time they sing and most, mostly it's with the passerine family. Mm -mm. 
Do, bir do birds preen all of their lives? Is there any time that a parent bird preens a baby bird? Yes, they do. Oh my God, that's this an amazing question. I can I can talk like another half an hour. And <laughs> the thing, the thing is, you know that bonding, uh, which I would say that you know apart from feeding, uh, the chicks, uh, either it's a female or the both the parents are feeding the chicks. They also take care of their hygiene, and at the same time the preening part. Uh, they do that and of course once they grow up I mean the adults they do uh, preen because that's a very vital and necessary thing for the birds to keep their feathers dry and healthy and preening helps them to do that so that's a mm. continuous process but when they are chicks definitely their parents uh, do the needful for for the chicks okay um, when the birds are riding on mammals, are they always eating parasites or algae and, and, or is there another reason why they're riding? Because they don't have to pay for the ticket to ride on them. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so that's a free ride. No, not all the time, uh, but mostly uh, they actually on the back of the big mammals for the insects and the parasites they feed on. Uh, so it's like a free food for them. And also it's a it's another in a, in a different way of preening for the bigger mammals when the birds are on their back. So, yes, they do that. OK. And do you have a set of binoculars that you recommend? I use Monarch 7 of Nikon. You have Zay's, uh, Len, uh, Zay's uh, binoculars are also very good. A Vanguard is good. I mean, it depending on the price, like your uh, how much your budget is. If you if you have a high budget, then Swarovski is definitely is there. But it is out of. Uh, I mean, I think I think the one I use is pretty decent. Uh, uh, binocular. It's very good. Okay. I Excellent. think one of my best buy. Yeah, Monarch <laughs> Monarch Seven Nikon's. Yeah. Well, that is the last question we have today. So I will turn it back to you for closing comments. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. But I would be, I mean, it's its always amazing, you know, to share my thoughts. And, and I really, really, like truly from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate that no matter what topic I come across, I don't even know that how am I going to present it? I mean, how good am I going to present it? But I I just love all of you being there and I'm just telling all these things. So it's been amazing. And let me know if you do birding or if you have started uh, birding, if you have any questions on birding or while doing birding, if you need to know something, I might not be knowing all the birds you have out there. But at least the behavior wise and all, if you have any questions, I would love to talk about birds with all of you. Thank you so much and have a great day and weekend ahead. Thank you again, Arpita. You always bring us such interesting presentations. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.